A very, very warm welcome to another live Action for Happiness <laughs> event. It's fantastic to have so many of you joining us, uh, especially today as it's uh, Halloween right now. I'm in a different location to normal because back in my normal home location, there will be lots of children knocking on the door asking for sweets, <laughs> uh, including my own. Uh, and I am delighted to uh, welcome all of you uh, this evening, but also especially to our very special guest, um, who I'd love to say a little bit more about than I might normally. But um, first of all, just to say, Richard, it's lovely to have you with us. Thank you for being here. Great pleasure. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, will be very familiar with Richard Layard's work as an economist, as somebody who has really led the way in the world happiness movement in spreading these ideas that we all care about so much. But he's also had a huge personal impact on my life. Um, I read his uh, one of his first books, Happiness Lessons from a New Science, back in 2005, and it had a really profound impact on my life. And in fact, in many ways, led to me doing what I now do with Action for Happiness. And I've had the great pleasure now of working with uh, Richard as a mentor and a friend uh, in, in more than a decade since then. So it's a real um, privilege to be able to continue spreading your great work, Richard, through this amazing Action for Happiness community and really delightful to have a chance to have this conversation this evening. So we've called it mental health and happiness, but I'm sure there's so much that we can talk about together. So thank you for being here. My pleasure. Lovely to be here. And lovely. Hello, everybody from I saw someone from Tasmania and another from Vancouver. That just about spreads the world, doesn't it? It does. Amazing global community. Richard, mm. uh, one of the first things I wanted to sort of recap, really, which is you know, you've done so much pioneering work in this area, and yet you're an economist. And for many of us, especially in a world which is um, making some strange economic choices and perhaps facing some difficult economic conditions, why would an economist be interested in happiness? How do these things relate? Well, economics was invented, as you know, about 300 years ago uh, to try and uh, discover the conditions which would produce the most happiness in a society. Um, but uh, the problem was that they concentrated uh, on too narrow a range of things that affect happiness. So economics is pretty good at uh, telling us uh, how income is determined, poverty, uh, unemployment. Those are the things actually which I worked on uh, a lot in my period as a proper economist. But of course, from happiness research, we know, and from our own lives, we know, that our happiness and the variation of happiness in the community uh, depends on so many other things <coughs> than uh, income and employment. Uh, always top comes health, especially mental health, then uh, human relationships in the family, uh, at work, in the community, uh, and, and then values come out as very important in explaining differences between countries. For example, the Scandinavian countries always turn out uh, in the top uh, 10 or even uh, <clears throat> in the top seven. And the, the reason uh, is very much that these are countries where people trust each other, where people are brought up to respect uh, each other on an equal footing. Uh, and this makes a huge difference to the society. So when I sort of reflect on all of this and, and think, you know, what do we need? to have a, a, a happier society. I think in a sense, it comes down just to two things. We have to take care of ourselves uh, and we have to take care of each other. So we take care of ourselves by not being uh, pointlessly self-critical as most of us are. Um, and also by trying to find uh, some inner peace and some uh, rich inner life, um, which sees us through uh, the ups and downs of the external life. And then in the external life, uh, we have to take care of other people. And of course, some of that is done by the community as a whole. So you have public services, you have income support, all that is very important. But it's also incredibly important what we each of us do individually. And uh, of course, Action for Happiness Pledge says we should try and create as much happiness as we can in the world. And that, that is, of course, uh, the guiding principle for dealing with other people. So it, it's, it's these two things, keep taking care of ourselves and taking care of each other, which are not actually in contradiction. They're very supportive of each other 
because if you haven't got the inner peace and strength, it's very difficult to help other people. That's the oxygen mask principle, if you like. But equally, if you want to feel better, one of the best ways of doing it is to help other people. So helping other people makes you feel better. So these are a key complementary ideas for a good society. Mm, well said. I, I love that. And I, I think the simplicity of that sort of two steps to a happier world is so powerful to take care of other people, take care of ourselves. I wonder if we could maybe make the rest of our conversation sort of diving a bit more into each of those. And of course, coming back to this all important topic of mental health <coughs> as well, which is sort of interwoven into them. But in terms of, um, I guess, taking care of ourselves, the oxygen mask principle, um, first of all, it strikes me that there's been a real shift in people's willingness and ability to talk about our inner lives. I've heard you talk a lot about the importance of the inner life. And of course, although COVID was horrific in so many ways, it has at least, I feel, raised the level of conversation about our sort of inner feelings, our mental health, uh, and how important that is to absolutely everything. How do you see this idea of inner life? Do you feel that we're on a, a sort of positive path to taking it more seriously? I think we are. Um, surveys show people are more psychologically aware and, and and so on, um, but uh, and there's a huge spread of practices whereby people are trying to uh, get better control of their inner life through meditation or uh, spiritual yoga, many other kinds kinds of practices. Um, I think these all boil down to what, what I very much like uh, the way the Buddhists look at our life uh, as a, a sea. So on the surface. It goes up and down. There are ups and downs on the surface. Sometimes there are storms on the surface. But then underneath is the great silent stillness. Uh, and the, the, what, what we're all trying to do, aren't we, in these various practices that we have, is to find a, a way of cultivating that, that strong uh, inner stillness. Uh, and uh, I'm certainly no, no model. Um, <laughs> but... Um, uh, I've, I've been very much inspired by someone called Etty Hillison, who was a, a Jewish lady living in Amsterdam under the Nazis, who decided that she wasn't going to be afraid and she was going to celebrate life uh, up to the end. And her method of doing that, which really spoke to me, was to connect with what she called the deepest and best in herself. So every day she had a practice of, of connecting with the deepest and best in herself. And I think that uh, that, 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 that uh, is certainly something that I found uh, extremely helpful. Um, so I think one way of thinking of this is that everybody has got a better self. I mean, on the top, we go through all kinds of stresses and strains and we have petty thoughts, all kinds of uh, um, things crowding in. Uh, which we'd quite like to be rid of. Um, but we have a better self. Everybody has a better self. Uh, and I think to connect with your better self, this is a very good practice on a daily basis, uh, I, I would say. And then, of course, also, when it comes to the external world, connected, connecting with the better self in every other person, I think that that is a very good approach in our dealing with other people that everybody has got a better self and we want we should be appealing to the better self and the the good motives of other people rather than uh, working on the bad motives of other people um, I, I agree Richard but before we move on to the the others perspective I'd just love to spend a tiny bit more time on the sort of inner reflection because I think that example you gave of Etty is so powerful. And I've heard you say, and I hope you won't mind me say, sharing this with the audience, but I've heard you talk about how you try and use that whole idea yourself in your daily practice. And I'm sure many here will be fascinated to hear what that looks like. I think you mentioned that it's while you're walking to the, the, the train or the tube in the morning that you sort of try to reflect on this. How, how do you make this part of your life? <laughs> well, that's about all I could say. <laughs> but, but yeah, when I go out of the door, front door, I, I've, I've, I enter a sort of slightly, well, it feels like a sort of sacred space mm. as, I, as I walk down the road and, and I, I think of this practice, I try to practice it. 
And she described it as a sort of visceral process. And I, I think um, it can be a, a, a sort of visceral process, which then affects how you feel for a lot of the rest of the day. And I think it's worth doing it. But as I said, I am absolutely no model for uh, no, but I, I think that spiritual humility, or contemplative practice. That, that great humility is, is what <clears throat> one of your wonderful strengths. And I think that actually there isn't any perfect way of doing this. And in fact, what I'd love to do, if you wouldn't mind me taking a moment now, is to actually invite the whole community to... Well, yes, absolutely. Because I think we all do things to nourish our inner lives, and I'd be happy to share one of my own practices in a moment. But I might just turn to all of you, if you'd be willing, maybe just take a moment to think about what do you do on a daily or maybe regular basis to nourish your inner life? Uh, maybe you could share a, um, a few words in the chat. We can see what people say. So I'm seeing, I'll just read some of these out to you as they fly past, uh, Richard. So praying, breathing, breath work, getting enough rest, walking in nature, gratitude, listening to music, meditation, um, living in the moment, uh, sort of writing down journaling, swimming, being present, making art, setting an intention, being in nature, listening to music, uh, knowing that I've done my best, positive visualization, and many, many others. Um, I feel very uplifted hearing that list, Richard, because of course they're, they're all very personal, but I, I think, as you said earlier, there's some common sense of inner peace or inner stillness to some extent within many of those. Absolutely. No, I, all of those make sense to me. Absolutely. Um, Richard, as you know, we've been um, using a, a sort of daily practice uh, in parts of the Action for Happiness community, uh, which I found a real source of strength, sort of something that supports my inner peace. I wondered if we might um, go through this together with the community now, if you'd be up for that. I think it'd be terrific. Yes. No, I'm, 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 I'm actually very keen, Mark, as you know, on, on our movement offering something that can be of practical use uh, to most people. Well, let me just do a really brief version of this now. So I'd invite all of you, wherever you are, just to take um, a moment. There are three parts to this exercise. And the first part is just really pausing to just breathe and notice what's going on for you right now, how you're feeling. Just the sensations in your body or any sort of emotions that are arising. And just sort of be present with your uh, feeling right now. And then just try to bring your attention to one thing that you, you feel grateful for right now. I found myself feeling very grateful for health today because a, a number of dear friends and loved ones are dealing with health issues at the moment. And it's really reminded me how blessed we are when we are able to feel well. And then the final part of this exercise is to take um, that feeling of gratitude and sort of to send it outwards to sort of send a sense of love and warm feeling out into the world um so maybe to, to a place where that's needed right now that might be a particular person that's on your mind or a particular cause just to send out those those feelings of well-wishing um, out into the world so in my case having just brought to mind a sense of gratitude for health i'm sort of really bringing to mind people who are struggling with their health or whose loved ones are ill right now and really sending love out to them. Thank you. That was a very brief version of a sort of three part thing that I've been doing now for some months of just being mindful, being grateful, and then sending out a sense of love and kindness to the world. And I found that it changes the way I approach my day. So it's a little version of my inner practice. So thank you for sharing your um, your sort of sense of sacred on the, on the walk to for the tube and thank you all for sharing what you do in the chat as well um so let's let's sort of bridge from that richard because in many ways the the inner life is is part of the joy of being human but also we can run into many challenges around um our our inner emotional state and particularly many of us deal with mental health challenges and i know it's something you've put a huge amount of thought and work into in making people aware of the importance of mental health and, and being able to seek support for it. When did this first come to mind for you, really, in your work, that, that actually we really un undervalue mental health in our systems and our services and support? 
Well, if you want an autobiography, my, my father was a, a Jungian analyst. Um, so I, I, I grew up thinking this mattered. Um, I then even more thought it mattered when the uh, chaplain of my college at Cambridge threw himself off the chapel roof. So I've always thought it mattered. Of course it matters. And I've taken some trouble actually in my research to um, not only include when you're trying to explain uh, why some people are very dissatisfied with their lives, to not only include quotes, objective phenomena, but subjective phenomena subject to a reasonably objective measurement. So I've been putting into uh, my uh, explanations of why some people are very dissatisfied with their lives, uh, the, uh, the fact of whether or not they have ever been diagnosed with a depression or an anxiety disorder. And that actually turns out in most countries to be the single best predictor of uh, being dissatisfied with your life, much more than poverty. And so I've been trying to push this uh, uh, as a, as a policy matter, because I'm somewhat involved in the policy world. Um, and uh, of course, what influenced me very much was that um, over the last 30 or 40 years, we do now have a, a whole range of evidence-based psychological therapies where uh, we know what is being done and we're able to measure a person's condition before and after, and we can do it in a, a proper uh, trialed form. Uh, to see what the effect is. Um, and th these therapies have quite good recovery rates of, of well over a half. Um, so I'm very keen and I've taken some trouble to get them uh, developed in Britain's National Health Service. So if you take, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is perhaps the most common, um, it's based on a very simple idea uh, that the way to affect or to help a person to change their feelings is to change their thoughts. So obviously there's a circle between thoughts and feelings. Feelings affect thoughts and thoughts affect feelings, but the way into this circle, especially if it's a vicious circle, is through the thoughts. Uh, and the, the, the basic method there is to say, uh, you are not the prisoner of your thoughts. You can step aside from your thoughts and you can observe your thoughts as phenomena, and you can see how they, how they are. Are some of them unduly negative, for example? It's not a matter of suppressing your, your bad thoughts. It's a matter of just noticing them. And if you do step aside in that way, you create a space in your mind for more positive thoughts, leading to more positive action and more positive experience. And uh, this has been a huge breakthrough. It's not the only form of evidence-based therapy, interpersonal, brief psychodynamic, these all have their role to play. But um, I would say to any of you who are really, really struggling, for heaven's sake, uh, get some help. Uh, and you will find that uh, it, is, it makes a, a, a huge difference uh, if you do. Do not be ashamed to do it. Uh, that, that is half the problem. Uh, the, the main obstacle, or one of the main obstacles to recovery is shame, uh, and uh, we have to root that out. And we I think we root, are rooting root, it out. Root, root, root out the stigma. We are all of us creatures of circumstance, and I, I think that this is a very important point that Action of Heaven stands for, that we are all of us the product of our, our previous life and our genes, uh, and we should love a person for what they are, whatever has made them into what they are. Mm, well said. And, <clears> I, and, I, and I'd like to believe that we are making some real progress there. I certainly see it within the Action for Happiness community. I'm someone who's benefited from various different types of therapy and support over the years myself. And I see very, very often in our community, people who say I was in a dark place myself and I've actually found ways to really change my life. And actually the lovely thing is they then very often say, and now I want to help others too. And, and so we're all very grateful to you for helping bring us all together by helping to found this community in the first place. Um, I, I guess what we both feel, I would imagine, quite passionately is that we need more 
campaigns for uh, for mental health support. I mean, you made an interesting example or analogy to me when we spoke recently about the difference between the way in which physical health and mental health are treated in terms of the sort of campaigning organisations. Would you like to sort of say a bit more about that? Well, it's a big problem, of course, because of shame. Um, the people who are suffering from mental health problems are not in the, in the mood to campaign, and nor are their families. So whereas cancer has got terrific um, pressure groups behind it, uh, mental health doesn't. And th that's why um, we all of us need to speak up. We need to harass our, our local politicians, um, whatever method you have uh, to, to raise the, the necessity, not just the profile of mental health. Now, <laughs> people talk about mental health ceaselessly. But the question is to get the money spent and to get the, the people trained uh, to deliver the, the treatments. Uh, and uh, that, that, that is, is something which we should uh, cause that we should all, all of us espouse. Mm, thank you. And one of the things that warms my heart on a daily basis is within the Action for Happiness community, particularly, for example, on the Action for Happiness app, many people um, raise challenges and their issues they're going through and then experience a huge amount of supportive, kind, warm-hearted support from the community, including recommendations for signposting and professional services to seek out, which of course is most important. But of course, we sometimes forget that also just a bit of a friendly ear, listening to each other, taking time to empathize and so on is a huge support for those of us dealing with the challenges as well. But, um, but I, would, I, I, would, I would like to say, Mark, the people listening from all over the world, um, the program that we've established in England is now being copied in five or six other countries. And if you're interested at all in promoting it in your country, it's called Improving Access to Psychological Therapy. And please look at it, look into it. Thank you, Richard. Uh, you talked at the beginning as our vision for a happy world about sort of taking care of self and also taking care of others. And I know I think we'll come back to sort of uniting these two, but let's say a little bit about that latter topic then, because it's so central to the ethos of this community about sort of a happier, kinder world together. I feel it's also been a big uh, driver in your life. Whenever we've been together, I've always seen in you a really strong sort of altruistic and sort of values-based desire to, to help and make a difference. And it's certainly your work has done that. What, what, why do you feel it's so important that we, we, we act to care about the happiness of others? Well, I, I think there are two possible cultures which we could have in our society. One, which is still the prevalent culture, is a kind of macho culture, where what we are saying to people is your goal in life should be to be as successful as you can compared with other people. Uh, and if you think about that, uh, a society cannot be happy uh, if people try harder to achieve that goal, because for everybody who succeeds, somebody else has to fail. So it's, it's a, technically, you can call it a zero sum game. We have to move from that to a positive sum approach to life where we uh, uh, rejoice when other people uh, become happier. Uh, so that's a, a, a positive sum uh, philosophy based on cooperation and compassion and love. That's what we've got to, to move to. Um, now, that, of course, is what the, the pledge, the Action of Happiness pledge, uh, is, is saying. So, so let's just remember that, <laughs> because that is, that is actually, in, in a nutshell, what, what Action of Happiness is about. It is about the pledge that uh, I will try to create as much happiness as I can in the world around me and as little unhappiness. I think that's a fantastic philosophy of life. Uh, uh, of, of course, it, it has been the humanist philosophy ever since the 18th century, but it's not talked about as much as it should. Just that very simple sentence. I think this is a, a philosophy that children should be absorbing before the age of 10, at least. And it should be, just think how that would dispel so much of the student malaise, people not knowing what they're meant to be doing in life. That's what you're meant to be doing, creating as much happiness uh, as you can in the world uh, around you. And that, that, of course, means in your private life, uh, it means in your work life, uh, it means in your life uh, as a, a citizen. 
uh, it means means every, every every aspect of your life. So, if we could get that philosophy to replace the macho culture uh, that prevails at the moment, we would have done something really remarkable. And I think action happiness has a, a huge role to play in making the world a happier place through its wisdom and the, the wonderful materials which you mark and others um, produce also through giving people a sense of belonging to something which stands for a better way of life and is able to support them in leading a, a, a better life so th this comes down to some practical things of course um, we we have got wonderful online materials which people benefit from enormously and that's everybody who participates is part of our community but the the most powerful thing is when you meet with other people preferably actually physically face to face or physically or face to face on the screen um, so mark i'm really thrilled that you have now redesigned the course because i was involved <coughs> at arm's length i have to say um, in the trial of the previous course, um, which had the most remarkable effects. I mean, the previous uh, course, which was called Exploring What Matters, uh, had the effect on people in a randomized trial of, of increasing their happiness as much as if uh, they found their life partner uh, or found a way out of unemployment. So, you know, we know that these are powerful materials uh, and they're now going to be relaunched um, in a course that's now called Happiness Habits, six sessions. So uh, we really want people uh, to take the course even more. Uh, if you are listening, <laughs> prick up your ear. Uh, we want people who will run the course. Um, and then after the course, it's always been our idea that people would continue to meet um, in groups, or they can meet in a group even if they've not taken the course, but that there should be the essence of action happiness should be people who meet at least monthly in a group around materials provided by action for happiness uh, with people that they know and uh, are like-minded sharing the same objectives because meeting like that uh, gives one more inner strength uh, it's quite difficult to practice all these things entirely on one's own one should belong to a group if one really believes in something, one should belong to a group I um, agree. that keeps it alive. And, and Richard, I have uh, really found a personal benefit from being involved in a local action for happiness group myself. And we met for 18 months or so before COVID. And then I think it's 30 months uh, online ever since the start of the pandemic. And I'm delighted to say that in our next meeting um, next week, in fact, we'll be back together uh, face to face again. So I'm really looking forward to that and I really agree with you the sense of the importance of that togetherness can bring but also back to your point about the two cultures I mean I was part I feel of the macho culture for much of my original sort of life um, in, you know in a corporate world and sort of pursuing success in conventional terms you know climbing up a ladder and trying to earn more money and have more status and, and material possessions and I found that deeply unfulfilling and led to what was with hindsight close to some kind of major breakdown and so I, I, I have tried to practice that pledge that you talked about, that try to you know, live in a way that creates more happiness and less unhappiness in the world. And as, as you say, I found it has had a really profound impact on my life, the way I approach my role as a dad, where I am in my community, the, 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 the goals I pursue in my career. So, so I think on behalf of all of us who've tried to live in that way, you know, you've been a real influence in trying to help us see that happiness isn't just about sort of self-care, it's about an ethic of caring for a everyone and I was really struck by a word you used earlier on which isn't a word we talk about very often but you talked about love and I wondered if you might want to say a little bit more about that what this in many ways is about a sense of love for ourselves and love for others what do you see it that way well um I, th I think we know that uh, people if they are really going to do something there has to be some emotion behind it. um and uh, I, I I sometimes think that the 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 old old fashioned words <laughs> are more powerful uh, ways of generating emotion uh, than the, 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 the language of, of positive psychology. So, yes, I think that is what we stand for. We stand for, for a, 
a society based on love. Um, in, a, in a few minutes, Richard, we'll move towards taking some questions. There have been many people posting questions. And uh, if you would like to ask Richard a question, please do use the Q&A function. But let's just, you've talked about the, the, the pledge behind Action for Happiness and the vision and this idea of creating a, a movement to, to change our culture. Uh, I've got a copy here of a fantastic book, your most recent book called Can We Be Happier? Which... Uh, uh, can I, maybe I can show... Oh, have you got a, have you got a more up-to-date version? That's that the paper. This is okay, the paper. <laughs> I've got an earlier version, but um, I, would, I would recommend this to everyone as a lovely synthesis of both the um, the big picture aspect of Richard's thinking, but also the, the sort of what can we each do in our own lives aspect. And I think it's where I wanted to go next with this, really, which is um, having made that kind of commitment to a happier world, we can bring that into what we do in our day jobs. And I, and I know in the book you talk about, you know, what we might do as a teacher or a manager or as a policymaker or as a parent. Do you want to say a little bit more about how we can each make this personal? Yes, well, I mean, in, in the book, um, it, it, it's based, um, uh, I think, almost entirely on, on evidence. So, for example, if you start with, if you think of a human life, where will... Where, where, where do we have chances of, of improving the quality of people's lives through things that we can do professionally? Well, obviously, schools are an incredibly crucial period in the human life. Uh, and we know uh, from experiments that you can greatly change both the, uh, the happiness of a child and their prosociality by giving them proper evidence-based uh, life skills lessons. Uh, so we trialed one of these in a, in a, a program uh, that runs from age 11 to age 15 uh, on a weekly basis called Healthy Minds. Healthy Minds is the name of it. We trialed that and of course uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it makes a significant difference to the life uh, of the average child, meaning that it makes quite a big difference <laughs> to some children, probably no difference to some others, but uh, th this is what uh, education does. And um, I, I, I strongly feel that um, the, the tilt in education towards exam performance and test performance as the only outcome, largely because that's thought to contribute to economic growth and, and income, which, as I just said, is not the only thing that makes people happy. We need to have a counterpart to that. So a, a lot of us actually are trying in Britain to uh, get schools to measure the well-being of their children, because then, at least as a measurement, to set against the, the test score uh, standard of value. Uh, and that's a, a big project going on in Manchester at the moment. Nearly all the children in Manchester are having their uh, well-being measured. And this, is, of course, is done in other countries, Netherlands, Southern Australia, and so on. That's, some, that's something school teachers uh, can uh, participate in uh, and help bring about. Uh, then, of course, at work. Uh, work is an incredibly important part of our lives, and it's the part of our lives that people like least uh, when they make their diaries. Um, the worst... Uh, period of the day is when, when you're at work, except when you're off sick or, or commuting time, I think. Um, and actually, incidentally, an, another even worse fact, the, the person with whom you are least happy uh, when you're spending time with them is your boss. I mean, this is a frightful reflection on the management culture uh, that we live in, that the person who should be inspiring you, making you feel, feel good about yourself, <laughs> is making you feel down. Uh, something desperately wrong there illustrates the need for this cultural change that we've been talking about. So there are very, again, very good evidence of how more cooperative uh, team structures um, where team members uh, are more participating, that makes a, a, a big difference uh, in the happiness that people can have at work and so on, community building, uh, and incidentally, I also think scientists should think seriously. If somebody's going into science, you should think seriously. Uh, what is the research which I could 
do which would make the most difference to human well-being. And in that book, I, I'd say, first thing would be climate change, cheap, clean energy. Second thing would be the elimination of pain, physical and mental. Um, so, I mean, it, 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 this is a revolutionary program. We're talking about a revolutionary uh, activity, I think, when we're talking about trying to um, produce a happier society. Yes, indeed. Uh, well said. Um, Richard, I'd, I'd love to, while we're talking about this sort of idea that we can all make a difference through what we do, just turn back to our community again. I'm, I'm enjoying seeing the conversation that's happening in the chat, and I know that people are always really um, keen to connect with what's being said. Um, I think that we can't all change the world and we don't all have the chance to be in a position you are where you can have some influence on government policy and and so on but actually in our own way we can bring this ethos of a happier world to what we do so I'd love to invite you uh, in the community maybe just to share in a few words what's the what's the way that you want to help bring happiness to the world so if you'd just like to share a few words in the chat I mean that could be about what you do in your job what you do as a parent what you do as a friend or a community member what's your sort of personal passion when it comes to creating a happier world. So I'm just going to read a few of these out again. Smile to strangers, give back to society, lead by example, just be kind, help prevent climate change, um, look after kids in my classroom, develop mental health talks, be a listening ear, um, create opportunities for others, um, support, listen, friendship. They're flying past so fast I can't read them all now. Um, the care for the environment, anti-racism, uh, bereavement counselling, uh, work giving to charity, making connections with others, being patient, um, promoting children's well-being, kindness and volunteering. So uh, an amazing, I mean, I find that such a lovely heartwarming list in just a few words there from, from the very much the small day to day, like a smile that we can bring through to the, as you were giving examples of, a, a fundamental choice of career or life direction. It really can be that profound, can't it? Absolutely. I mean, there's a wonderful range of things. Yeah. Mm. Richard, before we come to the questions from the audience, uh, and please do, as well as adding your own questions, feel free to vote up on other people's questions so we can see which ones are most popular. Richard, I sometimes feel there's a tension presented between these two domains that you've talked about, the sort of caring for ourselves, caring for each other. And if we really focus on that inner peace, you know, some people might say, well, how can we possibly go out there and change the world if we're too busy meditating at home um although in my experience that's not how it's felt in fact i sometimes feel that when i'm calmer inside i'm better able to be active in the world and making change well, how do you think these two things relate this sort of inner peace and the outer action i i, I think the, the the people who are most effective in the external world are people who are comfortable with themselves uh, i think it, it really important uh, to be at, at ease with yourself. Um, you are who you are. Um, we're, we're always trying to improve ourselves, but you can do that while still being comfortable with, <laughs> with, with where you've got to so far. Um, so I don't think that there is a contradiction between being comfortable with yourself and, and really improving the world, I think the, the people who have most improved the world have typically, not, not, all, not, not invariably, but have typically been fairly comfortable with themselves. I mean, the most obvious person is our patron, the Dalai Lama. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he is definitely comfortable with himself. And I think, you know, he has probably done more for a happier society than, uh, than most other people uh, over the last 50 years or so. so um, we, we're, we're, we're assembling role, Mark and I have got a little project, assembling, assembling role models for a, a little book we might produce. Um, but I think we, 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 we'll probably be able to find that most of them were comfortable with themselves. Richard, I'm, I'm um, reminded of a story, I may mangle this slightly, but it's one of my favourite stories about Dalai Lama, who was once being interviewed in a fairly sort of mundane interview situation in a fairly sort of uninteresting place. And the interviewer said, you spent your life um, studying and learning happiness. When do you think you, you were at your happiest for the Dalai Lama? And he sort of paused and stopped and smiled and said, I think now. 
And it's just a, <laughs> just a lovely sense of being able to be in the moment, whatever's going on. It's just uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's come to some questions. So a really important question from Bruno. How do you suggest that we could encourage others to be more vulnerable to talk about their mental health in a work environment? There's still a great resistance to hiding this and to showing yourself as being strong all the time. It's a very, very good question. And there's no perfect answer to it because um, at work, we are performing various roles. Um, we have to inspire other people with the the feeling that we know what we're doing, etc. So uh, I, I don't think that um, we have to be you know completely open all the time. That's not, not, not a sensible way of thinking about it at all. Um, it's, it's that we must be able to to be open um, if we are suffering, and also even more important, people who are not suffering must not feel it difficult to say to somebody who looks as if they're suffering, are you okay? And then have the conversation. And I think that, uh, that that's incredibly important, both with one's friends, but it's also very important at work. Uh, I think uh, the workplace is, is a place where people with mental health problems often uh, first, first first get the idea that they've got to do something about it because things are things are falling apart a bit. Um, and it should be very easy for a, a team leader to say to a team member, you know, are you okay? And don't don't feel bad if you if 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 you're not, tell me and you know we'll do with the best for you that we can. We're not going to penalize you because of it. Um, but you may have to you know, take some time off and then we'll arrange it to be reasonably easy for you to come back in uh, gradually and so on. So everybody has got to be comfortable talking about this subject. Uh, and and I, I think that, that that's, that's an absolutely the number one thing that people what, don't what find I've a seen difficult teams, subject to talk about. Uh, thank you. And what I've seen, and I know in some events that you've helped convene, is that very often people who say that they've spoken up about their mental health challenges um, have been terrified about how it might be um, received and then actually been incredibly inspired to find that actually it brought out a huge amount of not only sort of compassion for their situation but actual sort of admiration a sense of like I'm so glad you've, you've, you've created a space where we can talk about this and then other people will talk about what they're going through and it sort of inspires other people and can actually one person's um, willingness to take off the mask if you like actually can really shift the culture um, and empower other people to do the same. Yes, and uh, as you say, it's, it's when cricketers and footballers and so on start talking about it that uh, the, uh, the public attitude uh, really changes. Yeah. Um, then the, the next question that's been uh, really voted up is by um, Lorraine. Uh, thank you, Lorraine. Lovely to have you with us. Um, how, when you're so in the darkness of mental illness, do you sort of wake up and start the day positively or manage it better? Um, and the point that Lorraine's making that I think is really important is help isn't always available if you don't have the money to pay for it. Um, and so, you know, it can be a real struggle for people who feel as though there isn't any support. So first of all, do you think that's actually the case? I mean, of course, it depends on which country you're in about needing money to access support, because certainly that that is a really important critique of our ability to provide services and, and secondly any other wider suggestions around sort of how to help ourselves in those difficult dark situations no i think it is i think that is the case um that the certainly in britain the services the the most shocking uh lack of services in britain is for child, child mental health i mean and, unless a child is basically stabbed his sister um, you, you don't meet the threshold of getting treated by child mental health services. Um, th this is shocking. And um, what we need is um, services, uh, I, I think, a separate service for people with um, less than the most extreme uh, problems 
that, that are, are tackling problems that arise. I, I mean, social phobia and other anxiety problems um, that people have in adulthood have typically been there in childhood as well. And, and people, I think they, a study has been made of how long have people had, they, had their mental health problem before it was first treated. Uh, and for anxiety conditions, it's something like 20 years if you get treated at all. I mean, it's, it's deeply shocking. Uh, so the, the services are underdeveloped in every single country. Uh, and, you know, this should be considered scandalous. It, it, it is one of the most extreme forms of discrimination, I would say, against um, a, a, a set of people in need. Yes, yeah, so I, I fully agree, Richard. And so I wondered if we can together make any suggestions for people who maybe, let's say, are on a waiting list or are trying to access, um, you know, sort of treatment through the conventional systems. Um, although the sort of offerings that Action for Happiness has, for example, and, and no substitute for professional clinical support. Um, actually, I have seen people who are connecting in our community, trying out things like our free day, 10 day program, being willing to sort of share ideas with each other, be able to make, um, to find rays of hope in an otherwise bleak situation. But what, what other things can we, you know, or would you recommend to people who are sort of waiting for that support right now? Well, I, I think, uh, you know what, 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 People, the quotes that people in power do respond to pressure um, uh, and it's probably different in different countries but I would say in Britain you know if your service is not proper go and see your member of parliament and get him to raise it in parliament I mean it's a disgrace mm. um, let's come back to a question that Judy's asked which many people are keen to hear your answer to and many of us, myself included, were touched by what you said about this idea of connecting with your inner and your better self, the exercise <laughs> you referred to. Um, Julie's just asked, how, how can we actually do that? What, 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 what's, what's a way that we can sort of make that happen for ourselves? I guess it's personal for each of us, but any suggestions? Well, I, th I think um, that remembering a, a number of good things that you've experienced in the past and that you've responded to or that you've done in the past is a good way of keeping keeping track on, on it's not correct to say the real you but I think it's quite good to have a sense that there is something which you might call the real you which is different from this 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 person who's being buffeted around and um, feeling angry or jealous or all, all these other kinds of uh, of emotions that you wouldn't want to feel, um, that there is a real you that is the, this, this being who, who is capable of really deeply enjoying life and, and conveying the, the enjoyment of, or helping the enjoyment of life of other people. Keep, keep, keep hold of that picture of yourself and, and picture it in terms of some stories. Yes, I, think, I, I find things, that. things you've read, music. I, I don't know. Everybody's got different things. I mean, you know, I think of the Messiah, the thing, thing, the things which you you think are really you. But <laughs> there are people have any number of things, but things which you think are, are, are really what you stand for, hmm. what 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 represent you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I I find as you say, bringing to mind uh, memories of moving situations or loved ones or um, you know, things that have sent a shiver down my spine of enthusiasm for life, that kind of stuff is um, can, can really sort of help me sort of snap out of a situation when I'm getting a bit caught up in a day-to-day -day worry and forgetting the bigger picture a little bit. Um, well, I, 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 yeah. I, I, I connected with myself before this event <laughs> by going and playing little bits of the Messiah on, on my, my piano. I mean, there are things which, which you, you do feel are part of the deeper part of you. Everybody mm -hmm. has. 
Uh, as a question here from Jackie about this new version of the course that you mentioned. So you talked about Exploring What Matters, which was a course that was being run by volunteers um, face to face predominantly, well, in fact, exclusively prior to COVID. And, and you mentioned the, the Happiness Habits course. So Jackie was just asking you what that was called and how we access it. So at the moment, there are about 20 of those courses happening, being run by some of our existing um, trusted volunteers who we worked with for some years. And so there were a few hundred people on those courses at the moment. And in the new year, we'll be launching uh, a new programme where people can step forward to run the, the new course and get some actually online training and support to, to, to learn how to do that. And gradually, over the course of next year, we'll be seeing more and more of these uh, volunteers stepping forward and also courses happening in various places. So as Richard said, we'd love you to be involved in that. And please do stay connected to the community and we'll be, we'll be sharing much more information um on that over the coming months um josie's asked how can we encourage more people to embrace being kind to others when i watch the news it seems as a scarcity mindset and an us and them approach uh i agree with that josie and there's a sort of separation and disconnection because of distrust so how can we sort of move from distrust to embracing kindness richard well, I think that, that the great idea um, when we're talking about creating the most happiness you can is that if you want to create happiness, you've got to know how, how the other people are feeling. Uh, and I, I, I think that one of the most important skills that we, we have to, to acquire is the ability to feel you can almost do it as a thought experiment. I mean, how how is that other person feeling it? Whether it's your your partner or some some difficult person at work or what or Mr. Putin, how is that person feeling? To try and try and um, get into their uh, <laughs> into the, into inside them um, and see and look out from inside them rather than look at them from outside. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a lifelong um, <laughs> process of, uh, of of acquisition that skill, isn't it? But I I think that 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 is the essence of any any good relationship and also any fundamentally peaceful world. I I, I completely agree with the the need for sort of more empathic understanding, really, isn't it? The ability to see the world through someone else's eyes. Even if you fundamentally disagree with them, you might have an in, uh, a better understanding of why they are the way they are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think so much of what we see around us is people attacking the character of others rather than the idea of others and getting those two things um, mixed up. But I, I, to the question about encouraging kindness, I, I feel, I don't know if you'd agree with me, Richard, I feel that kindness encourages kindness. And I see that when people do kind of things, it sort of has this ripple effect. And I felt that in my own life, where you see people that come into a room or into a situation with a spirit of sort of warm heartedness, and it does have this knock on effect. Have you seen that? Would you agree that there's a sort of, we, we can have these little mini moments of cultural change in the way that we treat others? Yes, yeah, I, 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 certainly, I certainly think that's, that's the case. And of course, happiness also, um, creates happiness. Um, there's that lovely statement by Anne Frank, isn't there? Um, you know, a, 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 I can't remember how it goes exactly, but a happy person that creates happiness wherever they go. Uh, how wonderful that we can all start improving the world from today. The extraordinary thing to have written at that age in that situation. Um, and, and there's lots of research which shows the, the ripple effect of happiness. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm, I really love that quote. Um, someone who I think is called Hiren, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, who says, firstly, thank you, Richard, for your insights today. I find it so hard to find good news amongst all the noise and negative news that's constantly coming at us from all sources. Um, how or where do you go for good news on a daily basis? <laughs> well, I, 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 I try and put the news in perspective. I, I think that's, that's what I would say. I mean, it's it's obvious that um, things that are working well are not news. Uh, news are things that are working badly. 
And so you, you have to recognize the fact that the news is not, uh, not representative of, of the, the, the total situation at all. It's a, it's a, it's a reporting on, on, on failures. And in a way, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we want people to, we, we were just talking earlier on about reporting on a failure to do with the treatment of mental health. We want people to report on failures because that's the way to get them addressed. So I think that um, there's good news all around us. <laughs> I mean, we just have to think of our daily lives, all the, all the nice things that happen. That, that, that's what I would say is the, the, the way to keep the news in perspective. And maybe I'll tell you this, this extraordinary, it's a whole, whole, um, whole lot of research on um, what happens when uh, experimenters drop wallets in the street. Um, how many of them get returned? And this has been done in 50 countries and more. Um, of course, they're all, they're all returned in, in Oslo and Copenhagen. <laughs> but they're, they're not in some other countries. But, but here are two really interesting findings. First, when, when people are asked, how many of these wallets do you think will be returned? The answer that they give is typically about a half of how many actually get returned. So people, probably all of us, underestimate the goodness of our fellow humans. And it's a very, it's a very important and striking fact that, that we actually underestimate how much good people are doing. The second, just more extraordinarily extreme fact is that the wallets are more likely to return the more money they have in them. <laughs> person picks up a wallet, they're more likely to send it back to the owner if it has a lot of money in it than if it hasn't. I mean, that, that is a one in the eye for the economist, isn't it? <laughs> well, that takes us full circle back to the start of how you as an economist have cared so much about happiness and um, I have been so inspired by all the work you've done and the influence you've had on this community. Um, on behalf of all of us, Richard, thank you for uh, everything you've shared today and for answering all those questions. Thank you to everyone who's asked a question. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to all of them. Uh, there's so much of what we've talked about that you can take forward from this event. You can, uh, if you haven't already, download the Action Happiness app and get involved on a daily basis with these ideas and a really inspiring community. There's plenty more of these fantastic events coming up. But as Richard says, what we'd love to help more of us do is to get together in face to face communities, whether that's on Zoom or whether that's in person in our communities. So please do try and find your nearest opportunity to connect with others uh, through a local action happiness group or course. Or if there isn't one, maybe start one up and put into practice this real spirit that Richard shared with us about if we want a happier world, which I think we all do. Uh, it's about caring for ourselves and caring for each other and how these two things become the foundation for our lives and our society. Richard, um, is there a final thought or something you'd like to say to sort of bring this all to a close? Well, thank you all so much for, for being here. Um, uh, I hope you all heard what Mark just said. <laughs> and I, I do think that um, the action for happiness has a huge potential to change the world. Um, and we're only just at the very starting point of it, but I, we do, uh, expect um, over the years to grow worldwide um, to see tens of thousands of groups but this of course depends on people like you stepping forward and helping us run them. Um, I, I do actually think that there's a whole tide of change going on of which we're a part um, which will produce a better culture uh, and will produce uh, a happier world. Uh, and I, I love the thought that you're going to be at the vanguard of it. So thank you so much. Yeah, I love that thought too. And I, and I love your reminder that there's so much more good in the world than we tend to realise. Thank you so yeah. much, Richard. Thank you, everyone. And look forward to seeing you all again really soon. Bye-bye.